All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. As Hi. always, this the Salon de Art is uh, brought to you by the Art Center, and we are happy to support the arts, and we love this group because, um, I mean, how many years has this been going on, Judy? Like, it's over 10 now. Yes, so we will be talking for about an hour and um, there will be question and answers. Yeah. All right, I'm going to share screen and let Judy. Um, anyway, I saw the infinity rooms at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta in 2018. I would have gotten so much more out of it if I had known about the artist. There's me and my grandson in the infinity room and i took the dots because i figured they had enough dots on there already and my grandson said grandma you can't do that i said yeah she'll be happy that i have a momentum so i uh i'll give you about eight minutes of background and show a few pieces of her work and then i'll show you an eight minute uh youtube documentary followed by Elizabeth. Yoya Kusama is a 91-year-old Japanese contemporary woman artist whose work primarily is in sculptures made out of cloth and installations using mirrors. Her work is based on conceptual art and shows some attributes of feminism, minimalism, surrealism, art group, pop art, and abstract expressionism and it's infused with autobiographical, psychological, and sexual content. You can see that she was from a wealthy family and well-connected, who were well-connected. She had two older brothers and an older sister. Her father owned a seed nursery business, so she was surrounded by fields of flowers and plants of every color and description. You will see their influence in her paintings. Her mother was definitely emotionally and some say physically abusive of her youngest child. Besides, they did not want her to be an artist, but to wear, marry a wealthy man and have a family as her older sister had done. In 1939, at the age of 10, three things happened to Yoyoi that will be, affect her life. Her father was having affairs, so her mother asked Yoyoi to spy on her father and let her know the details of the affair. This gave Yoyoi obviously a very warped sense of sex. And she used the phallic symbol in her sculptural work to help her work through her aversion to sex. That looks like metal, but it's all stuffed cloth. She started having visual hallucinations, flashes of light, auras or dense fields of dust. She remembered a time when she was looking at a tablecloth that had flowers on it, and she saw the flowers go from the tablecloth to the window, to the ceiling, to finally engulfing her. She was scared to death and ran away as fast as she could to escape it. But that feeling has, of, of being obliterated <clears throat> and to resolve in the infinity of endless time and absoluteness of space was frightening and stayed with her forever. She started painting in her spare time. Art became her medicine, um, although it is also an obsessive compulsive activity for her. Her mother would find her artwork and throw it away. At one point she found her palette and just threw it across the room. In 1942, during the war, at the age of 13, she went to work in a, in a parachute factory, sewing parachutes. She says she spent her adolescence in, closed in darkness because of the air raids, but she could also, she could always see the, B, the American B-29s overhead in broad daylight. This period, she began to value notions of personal and creative freedom. Her passion for pumpkins, which as you can see, is that one is six feet tall. But she had pumpkins everywhere. And this one is because that was the food that was always available during the war. So she, while some people have an aversion to the food they, they could eat, they had to eat, she had a love for it. 
When she insisted on going to art school after graduating high school, her parents told her she was no longer welcome in their home. Now, people have said how, um, what a self-promoter she is. Well, if you have to be on your own at the age of 18 and you want to do art, what would you do? <clears throat> she went to Kyoto City University of Arts where she learned the traditional Japanese painting techniques. From 1950 to 1956, she produced abstract natural forms in watercolor, gouache, and oil, primarily on paper. What you're seeing now on, on the left side are her net drawings. She has, she has solo show in her hometown where a psychiatrist recognized her work as coming from the disorder of senescopathy, abnormal physical sensation and a feeling of malaise. Since her artwork was too avant-garde for Japan, she started writing to Georgia O'Keeffe and Kenneth Callahan. They both encouraged her to come to the United States. In 1957, an uncle who was still in the ministry helped her get a visa. <clears throat> and, she, and she borrowed a, a million yen from her father. <clears throat> she said of her, about her net art, my hand does the work. I'm surprised to see what I've done. And I like it. In 1963, she created her first infinity room the one on the left. And for the first time, the viewer is allowed to be immersed in the artwork. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> she displayed permanently for the very first, she displayed this room permanently for the very first time in the Netherlands. During the 60s, Kusama was hospitalized due, due to overwork. Although she, she was in shows with Oldenburg, Warhol, Jasper Johns, and many famous European artists. She didn't earn the income that the men artists did. At one point, she was so frustrated, she tried to commit suicide. Finally, Georgia O'Keeffe came to her rescue and convinced her own gallery owner, Edith Herbert, to buy some of Kusama's work so she would not be destitute. I want to show you what happened. There we go. Whoops. It's one of the happenings. Um, this, this is the one that really got her into trouble. She, she did happenings, which was in, in vogue in the 60s, and did them in, in, in uh, Central Park and on the Brooklyn Bridge and all kinds of places. But she took this one, <clears throat> which is called The Orgy to Awaken the Dead, um, to to an unapproved and unannounced show in the sculpture garden at the MoMA, where they took poses copying the different artwork that was on display in the garden. This is another one of her happenings, both on the left and on the right and up above it. So up above is preparing for the one on the left. And as you see, everything had to have dots on it. Um, in the 70s, Kusana had a nervous breakdown and returned to Japan, where she chose to live permanently at the Saiwai Mental Hospital in Tokyo. She has a large studio close by where she works every day from 9 to 6. Now, she hasn't, you know, I said she was obsessive compulsive. She's written at least three books. She's written lots of poetry. She's uh, produced and starred in two movies. Uh, one is a documentary. Uh, she's written poetry. Oh, yes. And she had, she has creative fashions which have been on, she's had a little boutique in, um, oh, it's not Macy's, it's Sasha the Bee, um, in New York. Um, I can't think of the name of it. But, uh, thank you. Yeah. Yep, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now we're ready to watch the documentary. Okay. All right, so can you guys see the documentary full screen? 
Yes. Thank you, Helen. Okay. She was named by Time Magazine in 2016 as one of the most influential people in the mm -hmm. world. Her artworks often go for record-breaking multi-million dollar prices at auction, and her exhibitions have drawn unprecedentedly large crowds, resulting in insanely long lines and internet-breaking ticket sales. Her name is Yayoi Kusama, and you may be wondering, what's the big deal with her? Kusama is probably best known for her sculptural works and immersive but is also a prolific painter, performance artist, fashion designer, experimental filmmaker, poet, and novelist. Her enormous body of work has had profound influences in not only the contemporary art world, but also on a deeper level of social, political, and philosophical thinking. One consistent motif in Kusama's works is the continuous exploration of polka dots, from organic biomorphic forms, to large-scale woven patterns, to endless shimmering lights, to brightly colored dots on sculptures, installations, and human bodies. Another related idea of hers is the consistent examination of infinity. And the polka dot motif actually represents this on both micro and macro levels. Infinities can be inconceivably large or inconceivably small. So while Kusama's infinity rooms can invoke ideas of the grand infinite universe, her dotted paintings and replicating patterns also allude to microscopic cells and exploding atomic particles. Kusama was born in 1929 in Matsumoto, Japan. Although she studied traditional Japanese painting during her early years in art school, she was more interested in the avant-garde. Although her style did not appeal to the mainstream Japanese community at the time, her obsessive psychological expressions caught the interest of some prominent Japanese scholars and art critics. By 1954, she had exhibited in various solo shows around the country, as well as caught the attention of some Western collectors. In 1955, she also blindly wrote to American artists Kenneth Callahan and Georgia O'Keeffe to seek advice. Both actually responded to her, enthusiastically supporting her work and encouraging her to move to the U.S. She would eventually end up in New York in 1958. Late 1950s America was a time when many artists were reacting against the movement of abstract expressionism. Many became less interested in gestural brushstrokes and more interested in flat, repetitive compositions that are self-referential and internally contemplated. This resulted in enormous interest in Kusama's signature Infinity Net series. However, although her works appealed to minimalists, Kusama didn't necessarily conform to their philosophies. Nevertheless, her works during this period significantly influenced many modernist transition from abstract expressionism to minimal. In the early 1960s, against the backdrop of a psychedelic, politically charged era of civil rights movements and sexual liberation, Kusama began a series of soft phallic sculptures that she attached to all of her walls, floors, furniture, and everyday objects. Known as the Accumulation Series, she once again employed her signature technique of methodical repetition. Accumulations have also been compared to similar soft sculptures produced by American artist Klaus Oden. And Kusama's practice of repetition would influence pop artists like Andy Warhol, who was deeply interested in the ideas of multiplicity and commercial proliferation. But once again, although her works shared similar ideas with pop artists, Kusama's interest was not exactly in line with their ideology. Rather than focusing on pop cultural imagery and mass consumption, she was more interested in creating immersive experiences that blurred the boundaries between architecture and art. By 1965, Kusama had incorporated a more efficient way of visually expressing exponential repetition by using mirrors. This resulted in her first infinity room, Phalli's Field, a mirrored room that not only simulated the experience of infinity, but also made the artwork into a participatory experience for the viewer. How you are reflected within the mirrors, the way you occupy the space and position your body, inevitably makes you a part of the artwork. Kusama continued to produce sexually charged works throughout the 1960s, such as staging numerous controversial public performances. Like many contemporary artists, Kusama was aware of the limitations of traditional institutions, and she was interested in reaching audiences beyond the art gallery. These performances blurred the lines between high and low art, and was a significant step in democratizing the access of art for the masses. 
At the 1966 Venice Biennale, although Kusama was not an official exhibitor, she was invited by Italian artist Lucio Fontana to exhibit on the lawn outside the Italian pavilion. Her work was titled Narcissus Garden and composed of 1,500 mirrored balls. During the Biennale, Kusama placed a sign in front of it saying, Your Narcissism for sale, and sold each mirrored ball to passing visitors for $2 each. The Biennale officials quickly caught on to this and removed her from doing so. But through this act, Kusama drew attention to the often uncomfortable realities of commercialization and commodification of art. In the age of social media, the exploration of narcissism is also ever more relevant. On the distorted mirrored ball is the viewer's own reflection, which is often snapped by gallery visitors and uploaded to places like Facebook, Instagram, or Snapchat. In later years, Kusama would continue to bring her art out into the world, as well as bring visitors into immersive environments by inviting them to become a part of the artwork. The Obliteration Room has been a traveling installation since 2002, where it starts off as a completely wet room filled with white domestic furniture. Visitors are given a pad of colorful circular stickers to place anywhere in the room. As the exhibition goes on, the room is transformed into another explosion of brightly colored polka dots. In the early 2000s, Kusama made a departure from her earlier vivid and sculptural infinity room and began creating dimly lit rooms activated by lights and mirrors. These environments often evoke visitors to contemplate the experience on an existential cosmological level. Many feel that these boundless galactic spaces give them an out-of-body experience, as if your consciousness has been transported to a galaxy millions of light years away. I find it fascinating that, although Kusama has faced many hardships and challenges throughout her life, contrarily, her art seems to bring an incredibly positive, vibrant, and animated life force. She has also maintained a consistent ideological motif throughout her entire career, yet her visual language is always transforming and adapting to new ideas. She's been a key influencer of many significant art movements, yet she has always had a uniquely distinctive style that defies categorization. And in this post-internet age where the distinction of virtual and physical life is increasingly blurred, I'd argue that her ideas are more relevant today than they've ever been. With the ceaseless snapshots of infinity rooms shared across social platforms, each viewer is adding to the never-ending performance of Kusama's works, while also continuing her pursuit of democratizing the experience of art beyond the art gallery. If you're watching this video in 2018 and you live in or around Toronto, Cleveland, or Atlanta, or you can get yourself to one of these places, then you have a chance to see a spectacular survey exhibition called Infinity Mirrors. I'll put the links in the description below on where you can find out more information about those shows. But be warned, tickets sell out very fast and be prepared to wait in some very long lines, but I think it's worth it. Good luck and send me your Infinite Kusama pictures. <laughs> She's right, it was worth it. <clears throat> this, is, this is a street in Singapore. I think it's also been done in Denmark, where these are pieces of cloth, obviously painted with polka dots, that have, that have covered the trees with balls of things, also polka dots. Most of her things that hang are inflated, but everything else, all the, the floor sculptures are, are stuffed from. And her philosophy, as they intimated, is that these dots are, are what we're made of. We're made of dots, and the universe is made of dots. So we're all connected. And um, Elizabeth, you have? Yes. Tampa Shoulder Show? Um, so I, I was um, lucky enough to get to see one of the Infinity Rooms. This one was in Tampa um, in February. And so uh, she actually, um, they, it was this big room, mirrors, everything, and these tentacles were on the floor and on the ceiling, and they all came down, and they were, it was very warm in there. Um, because <laughs> they were inflated devices, but they would let 10 people in and 
people could take pictures. You weren't supposed to touch the, the objects, but you were encouraged to take pictures and walk around. And um, so we took pictures and then the guards were nice enough and it was slow enough that they let us in again. So <laughs> I was able to take a video. Now, um, it's a really short video, but what is that you'll hear two noises in the background. One is the hum of the air compressors that are inflating the, um, the tentacles and the other are, is her voiceover. She's actually reading a, a poem in Japanese um, that goes along with this. Uh, and a lot of her works go hand in hand with poetry. So I'm gonna play the video, my short little, like I think it's like 10 seconds video. Um, and then I'm gonna read the poem for you guys. It's not a very long video, but it was really kind of a, a neat experience. And this one was actually wheelchair accessible. So you could, everyone could get in. Every surface was mirrored. So the poem is called Residing in the Castle of Shed Tears. And I'm gonna go back here so you guys can see the space. When the time comes around for people to encounter the end of their life, having put on years, death seems to be quietly approaching. It was not supposed to be my style to be frightened of that, but I am. In the shadows of my loved one's footprints, distress revisits me in the dead of the night, refreshing my memories. Being in love with and longing for you, I have locked myself up in this castle of shed tears. Now may be the time for me to wander off into the place. The guidepost to the other world points to. And the sky is waiting for me, amended, attended by numerous clouds. Overwhelmed by your tenderness that has always encouraged me, I have been searching for love. In earnest, taking my wish for happiness along. Let me call out to and ask the birds flying in the sky. I want to convey to them my feelings over many long years with art as a weapon. I have treaded the path in search of love during the days I have kept through keeping this, I believe lived through keeping despair and loneliness, and loneliness all to myself along the way. There were times when the fireworks of life splendidly adorned the sky dancing in the night sky in a, in a myriad of colors, with fireworks sprinkled dust all over my body. I will never forget that exhilarating moment. Now I think is the time to dedicate my heart to you, my dearest. Was the beauty of the end of one's life nothing more than illusion? Would you give me an answer to this? Devoting all my heart to you, I have lived through to this day, hoping to leave beautiful footprints at the end of my life. I spend each day praying that my wish will be fulfilled. This is my message of love to you. Who was that written to? Hmm? Did, does, she, does she say who? Who that love was? I didn't hear all of it. No, and that's the thing that's kind of interesting because she talks about a lot of her titles involve the word love and my love for you or my love of pumpkins. Um, and I think it, it's a love of the world and a love of everyone, not so much of a specific person or even a love of the universe. Yeah. The world. Yeah, she talks a lot about the universe and our being part of it, and the dots are part of the universe too. Yes. But Carl Sagan, she, that one. She had a very close. All right, so now if anyone has any questions or experiences they would like to share, it would be the time. Um, if 
we're going to put everyone on to um, put on gallery mode and people can actually see my screen. This, this is Carol. I was in an infinity room in New York at the Met Brewer. Mm -hmm. I've never forgotten it. I tried to replicate it in my Christmas showroom, hoping that somebody would buy into that. <laughs> it was it was so transforming. I, I would have stayed there longer, but they had very you were only allowed in for a certain amount of time and you had to get out. But you, yes. you stood on a platform and there was water underneath you and mirrors all around and all those lights. And I figured, well, I could do the lights and I could do the mirrors. Um, but I just, I was in love with that whole experience. And then we were in LA and tried to get to one of the rooms and the lines were just unreal. So, uh, but she's fabulous. I've followed her a lot and I do dots and I did dots for years before I knew about her. Yes, yeah, the dots, um, it's, it's kind of funny how that they, the, she's very prolific and uh -huh, uh -huh. more prolific with her dot paintings, the net paintings, um, than she is with her infinity rooms. Uh -huh. Infinity rooms are, are kind of collaborative pieces where she'll come up right. with an idea and then someone builds it, but they are also the things that travel. Um, right. And they're the right. things that, that she's, it's almost like her signature. Right. Well, the Broad Museum bought one. Once they saw it in New York, he bought it for his museum in LA. Mm -hmm. And it's attracted a lot of uh, people that have paid money. I'm sure he didn't care about that, but the museum did. So it was a win win for what he did, I guess. Helen. I, I was also at the uh, museum and I'm, I'm, I was looking to see if I could find on my phone some of the photos. Um, <laughs> and this is one of the infinity rooms. Uh, you come away oh, here, with a headache. On. Sorry? Hold it up again. Maybe we can see it. No, that, oh, there we go. Wow. That is a little impressive, Lee. And that, and that's me taking a picture yes. there, that one piece. Um, you come away with a headache. You come away <laughs> with, with a, a pounding. You come away with a, um, an imbalance, an equilibrium issue. Um, and yet you want to stay there forever because it's so out of body. And I think that that's, um, all of her work feels like that to me as an out of body experience. Yes, yeah, definitely. Thank I also yeah. was there. Donna, oh, you went to the Tampa one too. Right, right. It was, it was fascinating. I've never seen anything like that before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one's ever done anything like that before. Yeah. And even the fact that she's in, uh, she was in the window of, um, Louis Vuitton on Fifth Avenue, mm -hmm. all her dots um, on purses. She's got purses that they have sold over the years. Unbelievable what she's achieved in her 80s. Yeah. And you know, remember that she's also working uh, in almost like a, a, a hermit like right. style because she's, she's a protected and secluded at, um, at this asylum. Asylum, right, right. But she has a studio. Yes. And she works from nine o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night. Right. There's somebody up there taking care of her shows. There's somebody else taking care of something else. I mean, there, she's got a, a big group there helping her. Of course. Does anybody have an idea? I think so. Pardon? What do you all think about uh, the amount of production that she does? You know, any one of those, I was in Tampa too, and that infinity room is, you know, enormous amounts of things to produce. And I'm sure every one of them is. And she was so, she is so prolific. How does she accomplish that? She has obsessive. A lot of <laughs> obsessive. <laughs> compulsive. If she's obsessive, compulsive, she doesn't sit still. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And not only that, but she does, you know, just like all of us artists, we treat it as our job. She goes into the studio at nine and leaves at, you know, a certain time. And she's at in six. the studio yeah. working. Well, not only that, yeah. her, her purpose of doing art is to, is, art is her medicine. Yeah. She said that many, many times. That yeah. If it wasn't for art, she wouldn't be alive. She's tried to commit suicide several times because, <laughs> you know, because she has so many different ailments. Right. But, um, but don't you think she has collaborators, you know, call them apprentices or, you know, like she hires production uh, people? Like oh, those sure. Items that were, you know, made the infinity rooms. I, you know, you don't make those yourself. You have them produced. No. Right. Well, right. it is possible. Remember her background that she does, she did work in a parachute facility. Mm -hmm. um, and then she is using those inflatables or she's using things that are stuffed, but she's using that silky material. It's a, really a, a kind of a polyester that she uses. Does she create, do all of the sewing or anything at this point? I don't know. But uh, like most of them probably does involve other organizations or assistants, but we never right. see them, which with a lot of, um, a lot of the other artists like Anish Kapoor or some, even some of the land artists that we talked about last time too, their assistants were very visible. Everyone was, ha was hands-on. Her assistants are, are very much in the background. And I don't know if that's because her assistants are, um, because she is working out of Japan. Maybe that it, it would be that she takes the foreground and, or the, the in the front, and her assistants kind of are not there to, to blend in um, based on, you know, the cultural norms in Japan. That could be, I don't know. Right. But who at 91 has produced so much work? I mean, what other artists? I know a lot of them have done work late in their years, but I'm not sure that they were in their 90s and still working as prolifically as she is. How many live to be 91? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, mean, and George, I can tell you, Ray Tebow is 98, and he yeah. still paints every day. Yeah. Oh. Wayne oh, Wayne Wayne yeah. oh yeah. yeah. Georgia O'Keeffe is another good example. Uh, uh, Marilyn Herrera. Yeah. Oh right, and my my favorite landscape. Whoever gets the powder. But she uses other media too. For instance, the flowers. Yeah. I mean, that's got to come from. I don't want to call it a factory, but more of a production facility. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's a studio somewhere. Yeah. Right. But what the, what is she, isn't that what, uh, a long time ago? She's no longer doing those, is she? I don't know. They were part of the exhibit in, in New York, so that they, and they fascinated me. So. Yeah, and oh, they're, okay. they're, they're really shiny, aren't they? Very, very, very shiny. And, and there's a lot of the pumpkins, the, the large sculptures. I saw one in Washington in the National Sculpture Garden. Oh, right, right. You know, it's quite large, and um, I think she's still doing some of those. She, well, you can, really, you can buy a replica at one of the art museums in their gift shop. I just saw something. Um, you could buy a small pumpkin for $252, $54. <laughs> well, the <laughs> pumpkin that I showed was actually, it's, it's an island in Japan called, uh, it's an art island. So they have installation art throughout the whole island. Wow. And there's walking trails and the best is to take a bike and tour all over. But this, that, that pumpkin is one of the, the featured um, sculptures there. Wow. I wanted, I wanted to say something about um, the artists, and I don't know all of them, there are a bunch of them who are doing art that changes you when you're in the environment, like James Terrell. Oh, right, right. And it's, and this is what she does. I'm sorry, I've never seen one live because they look fabulous, but it changes your ability to perceive. And therefore oh, it, it yes. changes you when you're through. I remember a Terrell piece I saw in New York one time and I walked out of there a different person. Yep. 
But yep. it also happens, there's a sculpture at the Metropolitan that I'm fascinated with. It's a, an old Chinese bodhisattva. It does the same thing. It just isn't, it doesn't enclose in the same way. But art does that. There are different kinds that do that. I think that she's been very successful in um, one plur, uh, for her, uh, she's so widespread. The Everything Travels Now, which is great. We get the show all over the world. But so her proliferation is, is huge. But when you walk in, like what Judy was saying, when you walk into those infinity rooms, you enter her, her, you enter her, you enter, you her, enter, her, you enter her universe. Um, right. You only come in one at a time. So Correct. Very yeah. personal experience. Right. Yes. And even if you came with two people, they will not let two people no. in. I was with six people. We each we each went into different. There were four room, four or five rooms set up. One we couldn't go into because it was strictly for handicapped people. Ah. Uh, uh. We could look. We could look in. They all all the rooms had a mirror, a, a window yeah. that you could look in and watch people having the experience. But I really would have gotten a lot more out of it if I had known a little better. If you'd been what? If I had, if I had known more about her, mm -hmm. I, would have, I think I would have enjoyed the experience a lot more. But as it was, I just thought of it as something very modern and different. You know, that's a really interesting point. Do you need to know something about the artist and the process or the movement or the materials to really get get it? Well, my experience at the Met Brewer included an entire floor of her work before I got to the Infinity Room. So I was enveloped by her uh, before I got to that room. But that's a really interesting point. Um, as to whether you feel like it is something that will be very special and worldwide, or is it something that you experience once and say, okay, fine, it was nice, but um, in this case, I guess I was lucky because I got to see more of her than just the room. Yeah, I agree with the because I, I remember when I went to the exhibit of Vic Mooney's at the at the Sarasota Museum of Art. Um, I think I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much if I hadn't uh, known something about his work previously. Um, I think having that background made me appreciate that um, that display a lot more. I didn't hear who the artist was that you're talking about. Vic, um, maybe I'm not saying his last name correctly, M-U-N-I-Z, at the Sarasota Museum of Art. The, the collages. I think it's gonna still be there, maybe. No. I think it's just I, I Victor, Victor Muniz. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. All right, now I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it, it has closed, um, but they they don't have the next exhibit to put up is the last I had heard on that one. But it will be interesting to see what the what they are going to bring uh, yeah. to show us next. It, the first one was, right? yeah, was wonderful. Yeah. Maybe if, if you have the luxury of time um, to, to see something before you know anything about the artist and then to go back so that you see it from with, with bias and without bias, without with the bias of knowledge and without the bias of uh, previous knowledge or knowledge about the artist like you would be in as interesting the... to compare. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a I good think, point. And this and is I all good points. And fun. Uh, the, the more we study an, uh, an artist, um, the, the more I think we can appreciate it. But it's also wonderful to, especially with these immersive pieces for a, and a very mature artist, 
um, you know, to just experience it first if you can. And, okay. and then like to have this presentation and learn more about her history is fabulous. Um, and then if we could go back tonight, that'd be even better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a new exhibit right now. Yeah. I um, want to stay longer than they, they let me before, though. <laughs> well, well, there's well, one of yeah. her. There's one of her paintings in um, Sarasota Museum of Art. The new museum, the new one. No, no, the old. The Ringling. The Ringling. The Ringling. I'm sorry, the Ringling. Um, Which yes, yes it's, it makes sense because they have a contemporary Asian collection. Oh, yeah. Well, this is in the contemporary room, which is relatively new, and it's just multiple dots in a very long painting. Lots and lots and lots of dots. All right. Well, is that anyone else have anything to contribute? I do. Um, one thing I know that I've heard about Yayoi Kusama before is um, in a interview that I saw of her, when she ha does large paintings like that, where there are specifically the dots, she said that she will not go to sleep until she has finished each <gasps> dot, and she is just possessed to put yeah. each piece on the wow. picture. I just think that's such an interesting thing about oh. being oh my God. able to do your art. And like each dot has a feeling to it and she's feeling it in her hand and you know sees the pattern in her mind and it's like something that consumes her until it's complete so like thinking that way i wonder if she, you know how she works with other people um we were when you were talking before about how many people she works with how she does that <laughs> with this you know intense passion that she specifically has towards the polka dots so right and I read that there are times where she will be up for three days at a time to finish something. Right. Oh my God, could you even imagine that? No one could. How, how did she make it to 91, my God? Right, yeah. <laughs> Maybe well, that's how she made it to 91. That's the way you make it to 91. That's a medical intervention. <laughs> <laughs> you must have a good therapist. Yeah, because when she, when she did that, she did that worked for four days in a row and was just absolutely knocked out and went into sure. the psychiatric hospital then too. Oh, I can imagine. Wow, wow. And interestingly enough, and Bob Burry just Bob blast this week is make circles. Is it? <laughs> oh, well, it. Um, you know, and I'm her, how she would re relate to other um, artists or work with them. I mean, we can look at um, Chihuly as an example. Um, Dale Chihuly cannot physically at this point do any glass blowing. He is a danger right. in right. the in the hot right. studio because of one eye missing, no depth perception. Right. So he right. works from he does illustrations um, with really big bottles of paint just throws everything around and does these sculpt these this is what he's decided we're going to do this and but he is very much involved in the process of the construction of them um and you know it goes back to almost like the old masters now do i think that that um Ms. kusama does that no i i think that she works because she is working very much in her head and very much in her um, in her, you know, in her person, in her space. Um, I think that what happens is that she will come up with a concept maybe, and other people, they will execute it, but I don't know to the extent that um, she may just have the final say on some of these infinity rooms at this point, and that they may just be another way for um, her work to get out there. I don't know how tied she is to the more current ones that ha that are traveling because they are very different and they have a higher ability for people to to see them. Right, right. Uh, yeah. She's probably just obsessed with anything that she can touch. Mm -hmm. So the dots are her uh, life stay. It's almost like her her bread and butter, her 
sustenance. Yeah. But the but the infinity rooms, I think, were something she conceived, and then I don't know what happens after that. Well, Interesting you know, question. Well, uh, once a performance artist, always a performance artist. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Can um, I add something? Yeah. It's it's um. A friend of mine who's an artist out in California, he said, asked me a question one time. He said, what is the one thing, if you did not do it on a regular basis, you'd go crazy? Well, if she doesn't do circles, she goes crazy. She probably <laughs> yeah. goes crazy even if she does do circles. Yeah. But I thought about it, and he's, he has to draw every day. And I thought about it for a couple of days. And for me, if I don't touch an animal, that is really hard for me. And so animals. it's a good question to ask yourself, you know, what is, what is it that keeps you sane? What, what kind of animals do you touch? Whatever is available, <laughs> but I have cats that I live with. They allow me to live in their house. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting. That's a great question. It is a great question. It took me, it took me about five days to figure it out, to get the answer. Hmm. And he, I, I'm going to share this with you because it's. I find it really interesting. I've done it before. Um, he was on a movie shoot in Santa Fe, and we would have dinner together, and we go to the movies, and we do stuff, and we always set something that we had to show each other. You know, what did you do today? Or are you using lines? Or are you doing this? Or are you doing that? So we had to have something to show each other, and it really was a productive time for both of us. <laughs> so. Why, why don't you uh, give us a little assignment like that every uh, two weeks or every month? Right. Some, something to do with art. <laughs> we'll add well, that. I'll, in. Maybe I'll add touching it. animals. So, uh, you know, <laughs> ask yourself, what do you want to do for the next two weeks mm -hmm. on a regular basis? There's a wonderful book about line and shape and color and stuff. And I used to use that in one week. I'd say, okay, this week I'm going to look for lines everywhere. So <laughs> I would see lines. And then I'm going to look for circles everywhere. And I'd see circles. And you see them everywhere. You know, in nature, in buildings, in people, and whatever. And it's just a good way to train your mind to see things and your eye. Yeah. Well, we so. need someone to, to tell us about their favorite artists in two weeks. Ah, yes. So, um, I share my screen again, so bear with me. Please tell me when um, you're looking at two screens and not one. So, because <laughs> I can't see it because I'm looking at dual monitors. We're looking at one. We're and looking at the Art Center. Center Sarasota. Yeah, that's all it says, Art Center Sarasota. Perfect. Okay, that's the one you're supposed to be seeing. All right, so I wanted to say thank you to everyone for participating in the Salon to Art today. And Judy Lee Stern, thank you for hosting this. We appreciate it. This is not done yet. I'm, I don't clap yet. I'm, I still have to introduce the next time. <laughs> that's all right. I'm like, Oh, I should really reverse these next time. I'll do that. Um, okay, so um, remember, please donate to the Art Center. If you enjoyed this, we always appreciate any of your donations, and it keeps us going. Um, and so the next artist we're going to be talking about is Agnes Elton. And Agnes Nelson. Oh, right? You don't know who that is. No. Patricia Rockwood is kind enough to, um, to be working with me to, uh, we're going to talk about this artist. She is, uh, you know, she was, well, actually, Patricia, do you want to talk a little about her? Briefly? About Agnes Sheldon? Yes. Um, okay, yeah. She um, uh, studied in New York with, um, um oh god his name is escaping me right now but the um uh, uh, teacher of um Dow um who also taught Georgia O'Keefe. She studied in New York for a while and but she settled in California. Um she is not very well known, but she um is going to have, she was supposed to have a retrospective at the Whitney, uh, the starting in March, but that got postponed for obvious reasons. 
the uh, whole COVID-19 thing. Um, she um, died in about five or six years ago. Um, but she's, she's very little known, but she did these wonderful mystical paintings, like the one that you saw, but she did um, kind of standard um, landscapes to support herself. Okay. Okay, is that enough? So, yes, thank you. Okay. So that'll be on, um, on June 19th, and we will see you guys then. If anyone would like to be the, um, the next salon after June 19th is the uh, 3rd of uh, July. Does anyone want, if it, think on if you would like to be the speaker then. If not, it's going to be me and I'll come up with something. So, <laughs> so there. <laughs> she was born in Germany, this woman? Yes. The word. Yeah. She's oh, born okay. in Germany. Yeah, I want to so make sure I got the right person. Uh, Yes. Well, really interesting. Yeah, been talking about I up in Brooklyn and then moved to California. Look, there's some really neat images I just came up with of yeah, hers. Very, very gossamer like layering of color. So. Yeah, very, very symbolic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, will you be reinviting us or are we uh, automatically yeah, we'll be sending out the invite? And also, this video will be posted on the website. Um, I'm also going to list the invites and the, I'll put some uh, images up for Agnes Pelton's work that, uh, that Patricia is going to present to us next in the okay. next weeks. So, okay, great, great. Yeah. Well, by the way, I think the person today did a really nice job. Uh, I Judy love yes. the video. Thank you. Yes. Thank All right. You, now can Thank we clap? You, yes, now you can clap. Yay, congratulations. Thank Yay. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Thank you very much. It's not fun. a book club on Monday. I will see you in two weeks. Bye now. The book bye. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye all. Um, the woman who started, there were two women who started Salon because they didn't know that much about artists, uh, Judy Nadler and uh, Cynthia McMullen. And Judy got tired of doing it after five or six years. And when she, when I lived out West, she told me about it. I said, oh, that would be really neat. So I took it over. And it's very simple when we meet in person. Um, it's, it's an egalitarian group and it's to learn about artists. And nobody, I facilitate, but there's no leader. Like it's not a lecture. Donna's done great ones. Several people have done, I mean, everybody does great stuff. So you, we pick an artist and then somebody says, okay, I'll do that next time, which is next month. Then you research it, and now that we have uh, internet connection, we can do YouTube. Okay. So um, we do about, it's a 20-minute presentation, and show half of that with a YouTube video or two. And then there's a little bio about the artist or about it, his, his or her work. Okay. And then uh, it's opened up to the group for discussion. So it's really about discussing art and being introduced to artists we don't know anything about or we've heard about and didn't research. So.